Hello everyone and I hope you're doing well. Now today we're doing a quick review of this BGCAC past paper for biology, paper one from the year 2022. Please remember before you start the examination, you should always write your school number, your candidate number is important, and also your surname with your initials as well. Please remember also to read through the instructions carefully and ensure that you understand each instruction before you begin. If you have any queries or any questions, you ask the examiner before you begin the examination. At this time, let us quickly run into question number one. Um, I have already answered the question, so to make it easy and faster to go through, I will only explain those questions that need explanations. And so, for question number one, it says, diagram shows a running athlete. It says, which characteristic of living things is shown in the diagram of the running athlete? And the person is running, therefore, the characteristic there is movement. All right, there's no need to explain that. For question number two, it reads that which term is used to refer to all living plants, animals, bacteria, and other living things in a given area. And what this is actually saying, we have different populations together. And a group of populations is a community. So the answer there is community. All right, question number three. And question number three reads that the diagram shows a food chain. And so you have leaf, you have worm, you have the blackbird, and you have a hawk. And so the question now is said that which three terms correctly describe the orc? I notice the orc is eating the black bird, so it is a carnivore. All right. Also, it is a consumer. And of course, it, it is a predator for the black bird. The black bird is the prey. So definitely A is the correct answer. And just a point to note, um, in terms of trophic level, because that will be a popular question, or it is a popular question. So trophic level means each feeding level. So the arc will be at the fourth trophic level. So the plant or the leaf will be the first trophic level, the worm is the second, the black bird is the third, and the arc is the fourth trophic level. So remember that the trophic level is each level of the food chain or each feeding level. For question number four, he said, which of the following could act as a biotic factor? And biotic means living. And so based on all these factors, the only one that is living is a cactus. All right, there's no need to explain that as well. The other things are non-living, and those are called abiotic. For question number five, uh, just I'll skip over that a little bit. So question number five here is so that the diagram shows a plant found in an ecosystem in the Bahamas and a close-up view of part of the plant. And so if you look at the plant carefully, it's a what is the name of this plant? And it is a mangrove. Notice the prop roots and notice also the propagule which is the fruit or the germinating fruit on the plant. And so it is the red mangrove. And I also will advise that you need to know the scientific names for the mangroves, all right? And also where they are found in terms of their zone, starting from the red, which is closest to the water, and buttonhood would be the furthest. So please make sure you know them. All right, for number six, it said the photograph shows a plant typically found in one zone of the sandy shore, and it said, in which zone of the sandy shore would this plant be found? And it is the fixed dune zone. Um, once you see these type of small plants, then definitely be the fixed dune. The pioneer zone will be the first zone, which is the one that actually in, in the water itself, right? All right. And of course, the sea grape and the woodland will be larger trees, all right? Not those little small shrub, all right? And so question number seven. It said that Mrs. Dorset class wanted to collect a sample of crawling insect and also flying insects. Which equipment would be best at capturing the samples? And so for crawling insect, a pitfall trap would be good. And a pitfall trap is just a hole in the ground where you put probably a bucket or a container to capture the crawling insects or um, organisms. They will just crawl and fall into the into the hole itself, right? Of course, you cover it to kind of disguise um, the hole itself. And of course, a sweep net will be best to capture flying insects such as butterfly. All right, if you go through the others, you realize that they really not going to make any much sense. Um, quadrat is for slow moving or immotile um, organisms. So organisms that really don't move, that's what you use quadrat for. A line transect is just to mark off an area, which is really to use to determine a line of demarcation or a study area. That's what they use it for. All right, so 
you need to know all those um, field study equipments that you use them for different purposes. For question number eight, is which piece of equipment is used mainly in clearing large commercial farms in the Bahamas? And we don't know doubt that must be a tractor. That's a large commercial, right? Um, the others um, can be used, but they generally use in subsistence farming, which is backyard farming, small farming. All right, for question number nine, it said the pie chart shows sources of air pollutants. And we have like domestic cooking. I actually put the percentage there because the original one weren't showing so good. So domestic cooking is 7%. Industries will be 8%. Diesel generator will be 9%. And transport will be 14%. Construction is 45%, and we have here waste burning will be 17%. So the question asks now, which sources are responsible for 25% of these pollutants? And so if you look at it and add up all the numbers, which if you play the numbers, you're going to realize that there are only two numbers that actually give it 25, and so I work it out here. And so it's actually industries and waste burning, because industries is 8, waste burning is 17, a total there of 25 no other combination will give it 25, right? no matter what to do. Because I went through all of them and none, none at all will give it 25. So the only possible option there is D. Um, for question number 10, it said, what is present in a plant cell but absent in an animal cell? And based on the options, the only correct answer here is chloroplast. And then again, I don't need to explain that one because we've been through that so many times. I also put the other possible answer here, which is not an option but also cell wall would have been another possible answer as well, but it's not a given option in this question. All right, so there, no need to explain that one. Question number 11, so which type of cell is responsible for movement of all living organisms? And when I say living, uh, well, it's a living, not all. I said all, but a living organism, and that one will be the muscle cell. Muscle is used for movement. Um, a plant cell is not for movement. You have ciliated cell. Ciliated cell will move substances. So they sweep substances, for example, from the trachea and the bronchus, um, sweep them back up to the throat, so you remove them from the respiratory um, tract. Um, the root ear cell is not for movement as well. It only, well, substance move into it, but the cell is not moved. All right, so the only thing that responds for movement there is the muscle cell, all right? All right, for number 12, and again, if you notice, I'll label the diagrams as well, so you can kind of pause, look at the labels, and make sure you know these um, diagrams and what the different parts are and also their functions. All right, so to run through question number 12, so the diagram shows a cross-section of a root which line points to the xylem tissue, and the xylem is option D as based on the labeling. Um, the phloem is just outside of that, all right, and then the root here, cell, and so on. All right, so this is supposed to be a root here, um, and the root here will have root here cell in them, right? So please just pause, go through the labelings, make sure you know them, all right? And also, and also their functions as well. For question number 13, it said which row correctly matches the macromolecule with its basic unit. And what I also did is to kind of match up all of them to the correct thing. So the only one that actually match here is lipid. So uh, there's a typo there. So lipid produces fatty acids and glycerol. So when you break them down, you get fatty acids and glycerol. So those are the basic units that make up lipids. Um, carbohydrates are made up of simple sugars, right? Such as monosaccharides and glucose, for example, um, galactose. Um, for nucleic acid, so nucleic acid is made up of what they call nucleotides. So nucleotides are the monomers for nucleic acids, all right? And proteins are made up of amino acids. So amino acids they are the monomers for protein. In other words, if you break down protein, you get amino acids. Now, for question number 14, and just to point out, nucleic acid is the relatively new topic that is on the new curriculum or syllabus. And so question number 14 is also a question relating to that aspect of the newly added um, section of the curriculum. All right, so question number 14, is so the diagram below shows a portion of a DNA molecule, right? And so I label them. So between two bases, you have what they call the hydrogen bonds. And the circular part right here represents the phosphate group. And then these little box here represent what they call the nitrogenous base. And you also need to know the nitrogenous base for DNA and also RNA. All right. And just to give you the letters, um, we have G, C, T, and A for DNA. We have G, C, T, and R, and U for RNA. Okay. 
And you also need to know the names. Um, I should have written down the names, but um, just in interest of time, um, T is thiamine. You have G, which is guanine. You have C, the cytosine. All right. And you have A, it is adenine. All right. And so the important thing, though, is that what is the name of the part label X? And so S, X is what is a sugar. All right. So S is a sugar. Um, and so X represents a sugar. And just make a note right here. Um, I put rib ribose and deoxyribose. Now, the correct one for this question would have been deoxyribose because it's a DNA. For RNA, it will be ribose. I just want to point that out, right? So it is a five carbon sugar. It's either ribose or deoxyribose. If it's a DNA, as in this question, then it is deoxyribose. If it was RNA, then it would be a ribose sugar. All right, just to point that one out. All right, so question number 15. It said, which enzyme is correctly matched with one of its sites of production? And so the correct answer here is C, because proteases, um, they are produced in the stomach generally. Um, you also have a protease that is produced by the pancreas and work in the small intestine. Uh, but that one is not shown because protease could work in the small intestine as well. All right. And just to mention that one, that the protease I'm talking about, but produced by the pancreas is trypsin. All right. So um, lipase um, works in the small intestine, not in the large intestine. So just want to make that correction right there. All right. So that's why B is actually wrong, right? Um, protease, if they have small intestine right here or stomach, that could be a correct answer as well. Lipids. Um, lipase work on lipids or fats and they work in the small intestine as well. All right. And um, amylase will work in the mouth, which is salivary amylase. And pancreatic amylase will work in the small intestine. All right. So there are three enzymes typically work in the, in the small intestine. All right. And they are produced by the pancreas. The one that works in the stomach is pepsin and it is a protease that breaks on protein. I right, so just need to run through your enzymes and where they are produced and where they actually carry the action. But question number 16, it said, wh which is a property of enzyme? All right, and so it said enzymes are made of glucose molecules. It's not true. I'm just going to make the correction right here. Enzymes are made up of proteins. Matter of fact, all enzymes are proteins, right? And so the enzymes are substrate specific. Yes, and that's the correct answer because they only work on specific food or substances. All right. And enzymes work well at any pH, not true, because, for example, the mouth tends to be neutral, close to neutral, the stomach is acidic, and the small intestine is alkalinic. And, of course, because of different in pH level, different enzymes will work there. All right? And that is the reason why pepsin is not effective in the small intestine, because pepsin prefers acidic condition rather than alkalinic condition. All right? So the alkaline will destroy it, will denature it. All right. Um, for option D, so enzymes are used up in one reaction. Not true at all. Enzymes are reusable, so they're not used up in any chemical reaction. All right. All right. So just remember your properties of enzymes. All right. Number seventeen is so the table shows the result of various food tests on a sample of food, and so we have here um, Benedict solution turns orange, and you know what that is for. That means sugar is present. Burret reagent turns purple. That means protein is present. Potassium permanganate remains purple because potassium permanganate is purple. However, if potassium permanganate decolorizes, then you know that vitamin C is present, right? And the next addition right here that I put here is that a test for vitamin C, you can also use the 2,6 um, dichlorophenol indophenol, which is abbreviated as DCPIP, which is DCPIP, all right? And that one will change from blue to colorless if you're testing for um, vitamin C or if vitamin C is present. And so based on the results, Bendix shows positive for sugar. Burret test posit shows positive for protein. Potassium permanganate is the same color, which means nothing else was there. So the only two things that are present in this sample of food is sugar and protein. All right, so B is your correct answer there. But question number 18, it said, which structure connects the mouth to the stomach? And straight off the bat, that one is esophagus. There's no need to explain anything there. 
But question number 19 is which organ is bile produced and bile is produced in the liver? Again, just you could pause that diagram, pause here, watch the diagram, and make note of the labelings. All right. Question number 20 is said, which is not a function of the villus. And the villus does not absorb starch. All right. So C is the correct answer. Um, I also make some extra notes here. Absorption of amino acid is done by the capillary of the villus or the villi, because there are many of them in the small intestine, and they are found on the walls of the small intestine, just to make mention of that one. Um, they absorb fatty acids by the lacteal. The lacteal is the central part of, the, of a villus. And here now, the absorption of sugar, and sugar, which is um, glucose, will be absorbed by the capillaries as well. All right, so those are different parts of the of a villus that absorb different things. Starch is not absorbed at all. Matter of fact, starch cannot be absorbed in the body. They must break it down first in the mouth, and then eventually in the small intestine, it will be absorbed by the villi. So definitely C is the answer. All right, number 21 and 22 is based upon this diagram. And so again, pre-labeled. So it said in which label structure does gas exchange takes place, and gaseous exchange takes place in the alveolus. And so Z is the answer. So D is the correct answer for question number 21. And let's jump to question number 22. It said, which two structures contain cartilage um, rings? And that will be in the trachea and also the bronchi. And so therefore, let's go back to show you exactly where. So W and Y will be your answer. So um, W is the bronchus. And so the bronchus or the bronchi for both of them. And the trachea, they do contain rings of cartilage. And again, for the trachea, the rings of cartilage they prevent the trachea from collapsing when you're swallowing food. All right, so while eating, the trachea need to stay firm. So the cartilage make it rigid and kind of have that little slight movement in terms of um, adjusting to the expansion, relaxation, and contraction of the esophagus. All right, for question number 22, no, okay, we just answered that one. Question number 23 so what is the percentage of oxygen in inspired here? So when you're taking air in, it is 21%. When you're releasing um, air, which is exhaled air, then that will be 16%. All right, so D is the correct answer for, for inhaled or inspired air. For question number 24, we're almost halfway. It said diagram represents an alveolus and its blood supply. And it said which, what process is represented by W? And W is gas going into the alveolus to be excreted. And of course, we should know what that gas is. That gas must be carbon dioxide. If the arrow was the opposite way, then it would be oxygen. So option C will be the answer. Okay, so diffusion of carbon dioxide from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that's what diffusion is. Movement of substances from high to low concentration, right? There's, there don't need to be any membrane. And the reason why this is not osmosis, because it's not movement of water. So movement of anything except for water is diffusion. All right? And we know that the gas must be carbon dioxide. So C is the correct answer. For question number 25, we say diagram shows a section through a mammalian heart. Uh, again, I've shaded the part that they refer to based on the question and also the labelings. All right? And so it said which labeled structures or chambers will the blood be deoxygenated? And so, on the right side of the heart, we have deoxygenated blood. All right, so therefore, P and Q will be the correct answer. And just to make a note that this structure right here, it is the vena cava coming in from the body, and then it goes down and goes through the pulmonary artery and go towards the lungs to be oxygenated and will come back into the heart on the left side to be pumped to the body. All right, so let's go to question number 26. I'm just trying to go as fast as I possibly can. It's a which diagram shows the structure of an artery? And A is an artery. There's a big reason why we could pick that up. Um, if you notice the label structure here, vein, again, these weren't labeled in the exam, just to make mention of that. But vein, veins have wider lumen, for sure, and also a thinner muscular wall. For artery, the lumen is narrow compared to the vein and have a thicker muscular wall. This is a capillary because it is one cell thick, all right, or one cell thin, you want to say it, because it's very thin, actually, to allow easy diffusion of substances in and out of the capillaries. 
And this is a dicotyledon stem. If you notice, the vascular bundle, they are kind of uniform in this diagram. So therefore, we consider that to be a dicotyledon stem. All right, for question number 27, um, he said, what is an example of a waste product that is carried in the blood? And so based on all the options, um, urea is the only waste product that is carried in the blood. Sweat is waste that contains urea, but is not carried in the blood. All right. Urine is also a waste product that contains urea, but is not carried in the blood. All right. And amino acid is definitely not a waste product. However, if you have too much amino acids, then you break them down into urea by a process called deamination. And you need to know that process as well. For question number 28, they say diagram shows a section through a human kidney and the related blood vessels. All right? All right. And so here now, um, again, already labeled. All right. And so the question reads, they say, how is the composition of the composition of blood in P likely to vary from the composition of blood in Q? And I want to notice that P will be our renal artery and Q is a renal vein. So we know that oxygenated blood is coming into P. And so therefore, to have less concentration of carbon dioxide, more oxygen, and also more urea. Leaving the kidneys through the veins, then it will be less. All right, so now for question number 29, we're going to speed through this as really fast as possible. In question number 29, it said one gram of carbohydrate provides 16 k um, kilojoules of energy in the body. One gram of protein provides 17 kilojoules of energy in the body. One, kilo, one gram of fat provides 37 kilojoules of energy in the body. And just to make a note, that carbohydrate is a primary source of energy. However, fats provide the most energy per gram, but it's not the primary source. All right, there's a big difference between that. Now, here it said that 200 grams of macaroni and cheese contains 50 grams of carbohydrate, 10 grams of protein, and 5 grams of fat. How much energy is provided by 200 grams of macaroni and cheese? Now, we're going to use the individual amount to work out um, the energy provided by macaroni and cheese. And so this is working here, 50 multiplied by 16, 10 multiplied by 17, 5 multiplied by 37. And they add up all the answers. You get 1,155 kilojoules. So D is our correct answer. For question number 30, so which part of the leaf is correctly matched to its function? Um, again, um, been through this, the palisade contains numerous chloroplasts or photosynthesis. In fact, the palisade mesophyll um, cells, they contain the most chloroplasts. The spongy also contain chloroplasts, um, but the palisade is where you find the most. And so the other possible um, thing that I could find a function for is xylem, transport water and mineral salts. Um, there, are, there are things we don't refer to any of these structures at all, so I only match up those two. And so the correct one that is correctly matched is option A. For question number 31, it says which two tissues are transported tissues in plant? Without any doubt, no explanation needed, xylem and phloem. All right? Xylem transport water and mineral salts. Phloem transport plant food in the form of sucrose by a process called translocation. Question number 32 and 33 refer to this diagram. And this diagram is a section of a flower, as indicated by the statement here. Again, already labeled for you, so we can go through it faster. For 32, now it said which part of a flower is responsible for protecting the flower in the bud. And to protect the flower in the bud, it is the sepal. So therefore, P is the correct answer. And please go through the structure of flowers and also their functions. You need to review those stuff. All right. Question number 33. So which structure makes up the stamen? And the stamen is the male part of the flower. And so it will be the anther and the filament. And so if you notice the anther and the filament, it is uh, included, inclusive of S and R. All right. So R and S will be our correct answer here. All right. For 33. All right. We're almost there. For question number 34, it's a diagram shows the stomata in a leaf during different conditions. And I just kind of label them and kind of give some information here. That this, in this case, the stomata is open. You can see the stomata here, wide open. The guard cells 
they surround the stomata. And in this case, in option in part P or diagram P, um, the guard cells, they are turgid. And the reason for that is because water will enter the guard cells and cause them to become turgid, hence the stomata will open. For diagram Q, the stomata is closed. And the reason for that is because the, gla the guard cells, they become flaccid. And the reason why they become flaccid is because they actually lose water. So water comes come out of the cells and they become flaccid. All right, so he said, now the question is, which change in condition could cause the change from P to Q? In other words, what would cause the stomata to close? And simply because you have less supply of water. So if you have decrease in water supply, definitely the plant will close the stomata to conserve water. All right? Or to reduce transpiration. 35. He said, which is the correct path taken by a male gamete um, from a pollen grain to that result in fertilization? And the pollen grain, once it comes from the pollen grain, it starts at the pollen grain. The pollen grain must land on the stigma. So it starts at the stigma, then it goes through the style, then it goes to the ovary and then to the ovule. A matter of fact, a point to note, is that when the pollen falls onto the stigma, a pollen tube will grow all the way through the style into the ovary. And what will release from the pollen will be sperm cells. A matter of fact, please note that one pollen produces two sperm cells. Okay? All right. Question 36. Is a, which is the correct definition for germination? And germination is, the, is where you have seed growing into a new self-supporting plant, or what they call a seedling. So the embryo of the seed will grow into a seedling. So B is the correct answer. All right? Again, there's no need to explain that one. That one is straightforward. I think this paper is a relatively easy paper. All right, this question now, it's a diagram shows a neuron. And this is a sensor neuron, as I label it right here. The reason why we know that, because the cell body is on the side. All right? Point to note that the most branchy, end looking like tree will be the dendrite and so the this end is the dendrite and this part will be a nerve ending and also the covering of the neuron is what they call the myelin sheet it helps to increase the transmission of uh, impulses the long section of the neuron is what they call the oxen all right and so just to make a note notice the direction of impulse dendrites always pick up impulse and pass it along the axon towards the cell body. So we know for sure that impulse always pick up by the dendrite and then send along the axon. So it must start at the dendrite. And we know that means going towards the right in this case. They said which structure could be found at X and Y. And next thing to note, if this is a sensory um, neuron, then it must connect to a sense organ because it is receiving the um, impulse from the receptor cells, right? And so it must connect to a sense organ, and it must end in the spinal cord in the gray matter. And that's where it will send the impulse now um, to the relay neuron. And so therefore, skin and spinal cord would be the best option here. So it must come from a, se a, a sense organ, that's why it's called sensory neuron, and it must end up in the spinal cord. All right, so next question here now is that the diagram represents the part of a human brain. And again, label, we have a cerebrum, we have a cerebellum, we have a spinal cord, we have a medulla oblongata. And they said, what would be the effect on an individual if part P is damaged? And part P is a cerebellum, which is used for balance and coordination. And so therefore, the person here will be imbalanced. All right? Um, irregular breathing. And blindness is controlled by medulla oblongata. Those are involuntary actions. And then we have, no, memory loss will be the cerebrum. That's where memory is. All right? Memory, emotions, intelligence. All of that is correct, controlled by the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain. Question number 39. It's a diagram shows a section through the human eye with structure control the size of the pupil. Again, I know most of you, if not all of you, will know this. This one is the iris. The iris controls the size of a pupil. All right? And please make sure you note the labelings as well. Question number 40. It says, when sound waves enter the air, which structure do the sound waves strike first, causing, struct causing this structure to vibrate? Again, without an explanation, this is the eardrum. 
The other name for the eardrum, though, is the tympanic membrane. All right, so option C is the answer. All right, the cochlea is one of the last structure. The cochlea does not vibrate. The purpose for the cochlea is really convert the vibration into impulse. All right, all right, and stape is one of the um, smallest bone in the body, which is one of the ear ossicles. All right, so we have ammo, stirrup, and stapes. And so stape is not even the first one, it's the last one of the three smallest bones. 41, and we are almost at the end. It's a which statement best describes homeostasis. And homeostasis means a controlling of the body conditions or any conditions of the body. And so maintain of the constant condition in the body, that's homeostasis. Rate of chemical reactions in the body is really a metabolic rate or how fast chemical reaction is going. Um, release of hormones in the blood is just a process called secretion. Removal of toxic waste or metabolic waste from the body is called excretion. All right? So definitely A is our answer. 42 is a diagram shows some blood vessels near the surface of the skin. And let me see what I'm going to say here now. It said, if vasodilation occurs at X, which is here, what happens to the blood flow at Y and Z? So what vasodilation means is that the blood capillary widens. And it becomes wider, which means more blood will flow, all right, and more blood flowing. And what will happen here is that it also expands closer or move towards the surface of the skin, closer to the surface of the skin, I should say. And the purpose for that is to release heat. So when the time is really hot or the body temperature is rising, then you have vasodilation. The opposite is true. When you are cold, you have vasoconstriction, which means the blood vessels, the capillaries particularly, they get narrow and retain heat within the body. And so because of the widening of the capillary at X, it will cause an increase in blood flow at Y and also increase in blood flow at Z as well. All right? 43, it said, what is the name of the fluid that is found at a movable joint, such as the knee joint? And out right off the bat, you know that is synovial fluid. And these joints are called synovial joints as well. All right? So movable joints, they are called synovial joints. Um, lymph. We find that in the lymphatic system, all right, that will produce from some of the tissue fluid and substances that come from the, from the cells of the body and so on. All right, plasma is a liquid that is in blood, we know that. Our right, tissue fluid is a liquid that surrounds tissues or cells of the body, all right? And again, that's a part of the lymphatic system. And some that you should know, the lymphatic system for sure. Now, 44, is it which shows the correct order through which sperm cells pass from the testes to the penis. And note here is that epididymis temporarily stores sperms and the urethra expels the semen or the sperms within the semen. And so the sperm duct, otherwise called the vas deferens, it connects the testes to the urethra. So by even the explanation there and the labeling, we know that correct answer here must be one, three, and two. All right? So two is the last one, definitely. All right? All right, so let's go to question number 45. It said the following events take place during the menstrual cycle, right? P is a development of the graphene follicle, which means the follicles are developing. Menstruation is Q, development of the corpus luteum, ovulation. So it said which shows the correct order in which these events occur. And so the first thing that happens here is menstruation. And once menstruation is going towards its end, then the follicles start to produce. And then once that starts happening here is that you have ovulation takes place. And after ovulation, you have the corpus luteum forming, which is also called the yellow body. All right. And of course, you need to know the four hormones that are involved in this process. So you need to know LH, FSH, estrogen, and progesterone when and, and the relative amount that are produced in terms of high or low um, at each point in the menstrual cycle. For 46. It said diagram presents a birth control device. And this is, a, this is an IUD, which is also called an intrauterine device. And it said, in which part of the female reproductive system is this device placed to work effectively? As the name suggests, intrauterine device. So it must be in the uterus. Straightforward, right? All right. Difficult to go up in the follow-up tube. Really, really, really difficult. All right, and really to block sperm cells from getting to the fallopian tube, really, right? Um, it must pass through the vagina door to reach the uterus, right? So, yeah, but it's really the uterus, intrauterine device. 
47. He said, what is the result of cell division by mitosis? And to have cell division by mitosis, what must happen is that one single diploid cell, which is a normal body cell, must produce two diploid cells. Get the same exact genetic makeup of the cells compared to where it's coming from. So the daughter cells, in other words, must be the same as the parent cell. All right? Um, B and D will be totally nonsense. Um, option C is a one diploid cell produces four haploid cells. That's the process of meiosis. All right? So C could be the option if they ask about meiosis. But the other, the other two, they are, they are really not scientifically correct at all. Nothing correct about that. 48. They said, which row on the table shows the sex chromosome in a male and the sex chromosome in his sperm cell that will result in a female offspring? And so all males, once you're a male, a born male, you must have X and Y chromosome. That's what define you, primarily define you as a male. Your chromosome, X and Y. A female has two X chromosomes. So for you to produce a female offspring, a female child, you can, as a male, you must give up your X chromosome. And a female, which is a mother, will give up one of her X chromosomes as well. So the daughter or the female offspring will have two X chromosomes. If you give up the Y, you're going to get a boy. All right? Because once a Y chromosome is present, you are a boy. All right? If you have no Y chromosome, then you are a girl. That's the primary way that you define male and female. All right, for question number 49. It's a in a monohybrid cross between two heterozygous individuals. What percentage of the offspring is expected to possess one or more recessive allele? And I wrote this out to make it kind of easier. I actually could see it. And so if both parents are heterozygous, notice the top of the box and also on the side of the Punnett square. To get this result, and the question, notice question asks, right? It said, what percentage of offspring is expected to possess one or more of the recessive allele? And so this box here, this box here, and this box here, they have at least one of the recessive allele, and so that is 75%. All right? So please have make sure you understand what the question is actually asking for you to really know how to answer. Question number 50, it said that the occurrence of which disease is determined only only by genes and not by the environment. And so coronary heart disease could be diet, could be exercise, right? And of course, it could be by genes as well. Diabetes, it could be by, um, by genes or genetic. Um, but if you are type 2, it's because of diet and exercise. I know this thing here say only, so looking for the only. So even though they could really cause by genes, they're not always caused by genes, right? Lung cancer, it can be a genetic thing, but smoking and chemicals are other carcinogens, and carcinogens are anything that can actually trigger um, the cancer cells to, to grow and develop, and you having cancer. But sickle cell anemia is definitely the answer. You must, that is passed by um, genes that you inherit that from um, your parents. If you're, if you're just anemia, which is a deficiency disease, which is a total different thing. All right, and so at the end of it, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you do well in the examination. And again, please hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so. Tell a friend and let them come on and join. And so you all have good grades. Talk to you soon. Have a blessed and safe day.